Chapter 6, The Financial Scoreboard, Seeing the Big Picture at a Glance. All three of the key financial statements fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Changes in one statement have effects on the others. If you know the connections, you can show exactly how each of those changes is related. You can also put all the statements side by side to see those connections at a glance. We call this the big picture. How the financials fit together isn't magic. In fact, it's really quite simple. Still, no one seems to have done it effectively until IBM executive Lou Mobley came along. Despite his very successful career, which included being founding director of IBM's famous executive school, Lou realized that he really didn't understand financial statements. He also realized that many of the students at the executive school didn't understand them either. The financial manager seemed to speak one language. The non-financial spoke seemed to speak another. When they got into debates, the financial folks usually seemed to win because their opponents didn't know how to answer their jargon-filled arguments. Mobley wanted everyone to sp everybody to speak the same language so they could work together better. So Mobley began teaching himself how to understand financials. What he found, surprise, was that most of his assumptions about financial statements weren't true. He had thought a company's income statement had something to do with the cash it took in and the cash it laid out. He thought cost of goods sold must be what a company spent or used to acquire inventory in a given period. As, as he studied the basics, he once wrote, one myth after the other had to be washed from my mind. But he learned those basics, the very same material we have presented in the previous chapters of this book. Then he began asking how the various financial statements fit together. The trouble with conventional financial statements isn't just that they're fragmented. It's also that the connections between them aren't apparent. Looking at this year's balance sheet compared to last year's doesn't tell you why you have more cash, say now, than you did then, or why your liabilities rose even faster than your cash. You might look to your income statement or your cash flow statement, if you have one, to explain the differences, but you won't find it easygoing. These statements aren't just set up to answer these cause and effect questions. Once you do understand the cause and effect connections, however, you begin to see the big picture. What Mobley realized, and that's what Mobley realized, and that's what we want to show you. To begin, let's imagine that Bill and Carolyn Michaels want to assess their performance of their company, Soho Equipment, during its first year of operation. Their starting point, naturally, is the balance sheet at the start of the year, when they first bought the company. The balance sheet, remember, is a snapshot of the company's financial condition at one particular point in time. The balance sheet looked like table 6.1, and you've seen this before, but I'm going to show you really quick. It looks like this. So if you want to take a screenshot so you can see it while I'm reading, there it is. Okay. Their ending point, similarly, would be the balance sheet at the end of the first year. Right away, you'll notice that there's a lot, quite a lot changed in this company's financial situation. So let me get you that other picture so you have that in your mind. So this next picture is the end of the first, the end of their first year. That's the end of the end of year one. You want to take a picture of that? You could do that right there. Okay. And there we go. All right. So right away, you'll notice there's a, that a lot, quite a lot changed in this company's financial situation. Okay. If you look at those two things, the amount of cash in the bank decreased by $5,000. Accounts receivable went up from zero at inception to 30,000. Inventory rose by 30,000. Gross fixed assets stay the same while net fixed assets, thanks to a year's worth of depreciation, declined. Goodwill also declined from 15,000 to 14,000. On the liability sides, account payables went from zero to 50,000, while long-term debt term debt rose from 10,000 to 21,000, reflecting the 11,000 loan to the company from its owners. Retained earnings is a negative number, 
So the Michaels equity in the company actually declined. Remember that fundamental equations, assets equals liability plus equity. So what actually happened during the year to produce all these changes? If you're like a lot of business owners, you turn next to the income statement for 1998, which is the year that they were running in. Soho's equipment is shown on table 6.3. So let's go to that 6.3. Here is 6.3. So this is the income statement from 1998. I think it was 1998, right? Yeah, 1998. This is their income, their income statement. So they have five hundred thousand dollars in sales, cost of goods sold three hundred fifty thousand, gross profit one hundred fifty thousand, depreciation ten thousand, goodwill amortization a thousand, marketing and selling expense twenty five thousand, general and administrative expense one hundred thirty thousand, operating income sixteen thousand, interest and other expenses a thousand, profit before taxes seventeen thousand negative. So their net profit was negative $17,000. Okay. Some of the numbers on the income statement do seem to explain the changes on the balance sheet. Check the net profit number, for example, 17,000. That's the same as the retained earnings on the balance sheet. Let's see, 17,000 retained earnings. Oh, on the yearly one. Okay, so then you're gonna see that here this number is reflected over here retained earnings so it's going to be different from the income statement over here over here is going to be reflected in the balance sheet after the year right over here okay all right Some of the numbers in the income statement do, I said that already, that's the same as, I'll read it again. Some of the numbers on the income statement do seem to explain the changes on the balance sheet. Check that net profit number, for example, of set negative 17,000. That's the same as retained earnings on the balance sheet. And depreciation on the income statement is the same as accumulated depreciation on the balance sheet. The income statement. Right. Okay, of course that's the case because we're only looking at a year's worth of accumulated depreciation. After the first year, the two numbers will not match. The other numbers, however, don't seem to explain much. The income statement contains no cash information, so it isn't going to be to explain how Bill and Carolyn wound up with less cash at the end of the year than they started with, nor can they tell from the income statement why receivables and inventories increased. Where are the numbers that will answer those questions? If your answer is on the cash flow statement, ding, 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 you're right. So let's examine Soho's cash flow statement for year one, table six, four, which is right over here. So we've got collections from customers, $470,000. Cash paid to suppliers, inventory paid, $380,000. Expense paid, MSGA, and G MSG and A paid one hundred and five thousand. Interest and other paid a thousand. Income taxes paid zero. Cash flow from operating activities OCF is negative sixteen thousand dollars. Fixed asset investment zero. Other investment zero. Cash flow from investing activity zero. Borrow eleven thousand dollars. Paid out zero. Dividend zero. Cash flow from financial activities, 11,000. Increase slash decrease in cash, changing cash, negative 5,000. Beginning cash, 25,000. Ending cash, $20,000. Okay. One number leaps out, negative $5,000. Increase and decrease, change in cash, yes. Increase, decrease in cash. That's exactly the difference in the cash line, the top line between the startup balance sheet and the end year balance sheet. Now consider another change between the two balance sheets, namely the increase in accounts receivable from zero to $30,000 during the first year. First, think of a moment about what affects receivables. One factor is obviously sales. 
and sales of $500,000 are recorded on the income statement. But Bill and Carolyn also need to know how much of those sales they actually collected. That number is over on the cash statement, $470,000 in collections. So calculating the change in receivables is a simple matter of arithmetic. Take Soho startup receivables of zero, add $500,000 in sales, since this amount constitutes new receivable, and subtract $470,000 in collection, this amount is no longer receivable since it had been paid. Presto, year ends receivables of $30,000. Now let's figure out why inventory increased <clears throat> by $30,000. Remember <clears throat> two things. First, cost of goods sold, which appeared on the income statement, is a measure of inventory out. <clears throat> In other words, the number of units sold times the cost of each unit. Second, cash paid to suppliers, inventory paid on the cash flow statement, shows how much a company actually used to increase its inventory. The net of those two numbers explains the difference in year-end inventory. Beginning inventory of $75,000 minus the cost of goods sold of $350,000, inventory out, that's why it's minus, plus inventory paid of $380,000 equals equals ending in inventory of $105,000. In other words, $30,000 more inventory came in than went out. The fact is you can account for almost every single change that occurs from one balance sheet to the next by taking the appropriate numbers from the income statement and the cash statement and adding or subtracting them. Right, Mobley wasn't alone in discovering this relationship. If you dig deep enough into the work papers of a corporate auditor, you'll find individual line items reconciled in much the same way, just the way we just did. Sorry, let me read that again. Mobley wasn't alone in discovering this relationship. If you dig deep enough into the work papers of a corporate auditor, you'll find individual lines reconciled in much the same way that we just did. So I want to go back to that statement above that says, you can account for almost every single change that occurs from one balance sheet to the next by taking the appropriate numbers from the income statement and the cash statement and adding or subtracting them. Okay. Accountants generally don't talk much about how all the numbers fit together. They rarely explain the connections to the business owners and they haven't learned to present financial statements in such a way that the connections are clear. As we mentioned, many accountants don't even produce a direct cash flow statement, which leaves owners and managers trying to puzzle out exactly what produced the changes from one balance sheet to the next. Once Mobley understood the connections, he invented a name for them, the continue the con continuity, sorry, the continuity equation. Then he created a simple one-page matrix showing the beginning balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow statement, and the ending balance sheet. His students promptly dubbed it the Mobley Matrix. So again, I'm going to read that to you. The continuity equation is a simple one-page matrix showing the beginning balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow statement, and the ending balance sheet. This is called the Mobley Matrix. We have rechristened it the financial scoreboard. The basic idea of the financial scoreboard is simplicity itself. Put the beginning balance sheet on the left-hand side of the page, put the income statement next to it, and the cash flow statement next to that, and the ending balance sheet on the right side of the page. But there are two secrets to making it work. First, you have to do some rearranging from the conventional formats so the right numbers line up horizontally. For example, change in cash must be at the top of the cash flow statement so that it aligns with the cash line on the balance sheets. Second, the signs of the numbers will be different depending on whether you're adding them up vertically or horizontally. For instance, look at the collection number in the cash flow statement. So let's go ahead and look at that. Collections number in the cash flow statement. Where? Over here or over there? Oh, he's talking about here, I think. <clears throat> look at the. Uh, look at the. Where did it go? Look at the collections number in the cash flow statement. 
the collections number in the cash flow statement. Collections. Number. Okay, look at the collections. I think this is what they're talking about. They're not specifying which chart. So look at the when you're adding up the cash flow statement itself, we call this doing vertical math. Collections is obviously a positive number since it represents cash coming in. When you're figuring out the ending balance sheet, however, doing the horizontal math, you're adding sales to the beginning receivables subtra and subtracting collections to get ending receivables. So here's collections is treated as a negative number. I think they're talking about this chart right here. So we're looking at cash accounts receivable, cash charge, cash. So I think we're doing the math this way on this sheet. If I'm not mistaken, I think this is what they're referring to. They're not, they're not saying which one. So we're just going to keep going. Okay. When you're adding up the cash flow statement itself, we call this doing, doing the vertical math, vertical meaning going this way, vertical math. Collections is obviously a positive number since it represents cash coming in. When you're figuring out the ending balance sheet, however, doing the horizontal math, the horizontal math, you're adding sales to the beginning receivables and, and subtracting collections to get end receivables. So here collections is treated as a negative number. They must be talking about the other sheet. Okay, we'll just keep going. It's easy to get confused by this at first. However, the different signs reflect common sense logic. For example, look at the figure for income tax paid on the cash statement. That's a minus in the vertical math because it reduces cash. It's cash outflow. It's also a minus on horizontal math because it reduces income tax due to the ending balance sheet. By contrast, look, look at the fixed asset investment on the cash statement. That's also a minus in the vertical math because it represents a cash outflow but it's a plus in the horizontal math, this is this way, because cash spent on fixed assets obviously increased gross fixed assets on the ending balance sheet. The logic here is that the financial statements show cause and effect relationships and the causes have different effects depending on where they show up in the financials. Yes, that's kind of obvious. Um, so I'll show you again this one. This is the combination one. This is the financial scoreboard year one. And then we've got this over here, the vertical math. And then over here is the financial scoreboard decoder. Oh, this is just the decoder. This is changing cash collections. This is the decoder of what we're looking at. So this is kind of like the, um, it's a decoder. Yeah. Okay. To help you check your logic on any given item, we have developed a decoder for the financial scoreboard. The decoder shows whether you add, a, add or subtract depending on whether you're doing vertical math or horizontal math. This is, so this is the decoder for vertical math. Financial scoreboard decoder income statement. Oh, so this is the income statement, income statement decoder. And then this is the cash flow statement decoder. So we got those two right there. Okay. Now I know what I'm talking about. Okay. The decoder shows whether you add or, sub add or subtract depending on you're doing vertical math whether you're doing vertical math or horizontal math. For example, start with the generic income statement, run the numbers downward. You start with sales, subtract all the various costs and expenses, and wind up with a net profit. Every line except sales is treated as negative. With the cash statement on the scoreboard, use the cash flow decoder. Start at the bottom and run the numbers upwards. You wind up with changing cash with the figure on top, right, because you want them to match. So yeah, you want them to match and be on the same line. But finally, let's look in detail at the horizontal math. Some of the signs are different than they are in vertical math because we're looking at the effect of change on individual line items. Take payables, for example. Payables are increased by whatever expense a company incurs on the MSG and A line of the income statement. Payables are decreased by the expense paid line on the cash flow statement. 
Start with the beginning payables, add MSG and A expense, subtract expense paid, and you wind up with ending payables. What good does this does it do to put all these numbers together on one page? After all, the scoreboard isn't a replacement for the three traditional financial statements. It's just another way of arranging them. But the financial scoreboard has several big advantages over the traditional presentation. Number one, it lets you see the big picture of your company's financial at a glance. It's like an executive summary. Two, it shows cause and effect relationships. You can understand exactly how and why your balance sheet at the end of the year or month differs from the balance sheet of the preceding period. You can see why receivables went up or down, why inventory has increased or decreased, and what the, where the change on the cash line came from. The scoreboard thus makes it easy to track progress against goals. Number three, it helps you fill in gaps. If you don't like a direct cash flow statement from your accountant, for example, you can create one using the scoreboard. So this is a decoder of the horizontal map. So you want to take a screenshot of that so you can look at it while I read about it. Oh, number four, it's a powerful planning tool. We'll see in chapters as we'll see in chapter 12. You can plug in projected figures from the coming period of time, then watch what happens to some of the other items on the scoreboard. It's helpful in detecting error, incompetence, and even fraud. If things don't add up, you know where, the, where there are mistakes in traditional financials. The scoreboard works for any company, anywhere, big, small, manufacturers for uh, manufacturer, retail, service, retail, whatever. Entrepreneurs use it, so do divisions of big companies. Pentax use it to help its managers understand their Japanese parent company statement. GE Europe use it to train salespeople from 13 countries most of whom spoke different languages. It's only a matter of time before most businesses realize just how powerful a tool it is. At this point, you should have a better understanding of your financial statements and more confidence in your ability, ability to interpret them. But understanding and interpretation are only the first steps. The next step is learning how to use your financial statements to manage your business. In the following section, we'll look at key numbers and ratios you, you can pull off your financials then we'll show you how to use the financial scoreboard not just to understand your company's financial performance but to manage it to set goals and reach them the end of chapter six so we will continue with part three chapter seven financial analysis to boost performance thank you for watching